Good morning and welcome to the International Space Station Flight Control Room. We are here today with Vic Cooley, who is the lead uh, scientist for Expedition 41 and 42. We just talked earlier this week with the lead scientist for the expedition that just ended, so we're going to hear a little bit more now about to what's coming up for Expedition 41 over the next couple months. Uh, just like all the other expeditions, they have a plan of exactly what they're going to be researching, and it includes a pretty wide variety, including uh, how human bodies respond to a weightless environment, and physical science and material science and particle physics experiments all uh, inside and outside of the station. Um, and then Expedition 41, I think, also features some new experiments in molecular, molecular biology and genetics. And uh, one of them is even part of a new approach to station research. So I think you're going to tell us all about all of that, right? Yes, I am, Brandy. I'm, Thanks so uh, much for joining us. I'm delighted to have this opportunity. Um, it, one of the things I really enjoy doing in my job is describing and pointing out the synergy among the rich array of experiments we have <clears throat> in almost every area of science on the ISS. And when it comes to biological experiments, most of them use model organisms. Now, model organisms are non-human species that, at a molecular level, have biological processes that are very similar to those in humans. And sometimes it's unethical and it's always very expensive to do testing on humans. So we use these model organisms to understand the biological processes in them with the expectation that that understanding will map into better understanding of those same biological processes in humans. Now, when, when I say biological processes and molecular pathways, um, it turns out that molecular pathways are triggered by molecules on the surface of a cell, usually on the outside surface, but sometimes on the inside surface. Molecules then trigger complex chemistry reactions within the cell. And those are the molecular pathways and signaling transduction pathways that scientists over the past few decades have begun to understand. And it's extremely complex, but these are the kinds of chemical and biological processes that are at the very building block level and fundamental level of life in, in all forms, in eukaryotic cells, in, in animal and in plant cells. Okay, well, so I guess that leads into, uh, on this uh, particular expedition, they're going to be doing some experiments on rodents, right? Can you tell us a little bit about that and also about the, the way it'll be done, the habitat the, the rodents will live in? Certainly. Um, in 2011, the National Research Council recommended that NASA continue its uh, long line of research into rodents as a model for muscle atrophy and bone demineralization. Uh, there was uh, a suite of hardware known as the animal enclosure module. And you can see uh, some photos of that here. Yes. Uh, well, this is the, the animal enclosure module system redesigned for the space station. The animal enclosure module actually flew 27 times on the shuttle, but it was only designed to support uh, mice and rats for up to 19 days. Of course, we need longer periods than that on the station, and the upcoming experiment that's coming up uh, houses rodents for up to 30 days. So the uh, hardware consists of three parts, a transporter unit, uh, the 20 mice will launch on the upcoming space flight, which has just moved to the September 20th is the launch date. Um, those 20 mice will launch in the transporter unit, uh, unit aboard the uh, SpaceX Dragon capsule. And th both the transporter unit and the rodent habitat on the ISS, uh, to which they will be transferred after they arrive, are equipped with video and environmental control um, equipment to make sure that the, the occupants are comfortable and in, in, in humane conditions uh, at every phase of their uh, both the trip up and uh, while they're on the space station. Okay. Well, that sounds like it, it should be very interesting. Um, I know there are also going to be some experiments involving fish and frogs as well. Can you Yes, those are other uh, model organisms. Um, I believe, uh, the, I don't know if the chart showed it or not, but uh, the model organisms that, um, that I can speak of today, and we have experiments on the upcoming increment, uh, bacteria and fungi and plants, and there you see the mice, but also fruit flies and fish. Uh, in the case of plants, we have four experiments, and the most common model plant among the, the, the whole uh, 
kingdom, plant kingdom, one of the most common research model organisms is thale, thale cress, or sometimes mouse ear cress. The Linnaeus name is uh, Arabidopsis thalania. It's a very common small flowering plant, and, and we know the entire genome of this plant, and it's widely used um, in research by researchers throughout the world. Now, in this case, obviously, those biological processes are not as mappable into a human as, the, as they are from the mice and the fish and so forth. But in the case of plants, we want to better understand the molecular pathways and signal transduction so that we can optimize biomass production both in spaceflight and on Earth for better feeding the world's population. So uh, it turns out that there is a new thrust um, in NASA. It's the leading approach to make the genetic and molecular uh, pathway type of information that we're discovering on uh, space flight of these model organisms widely available in a, in a public open source platform. This program is known as Gene Lab, and one of the plan experiments flown by uh, researchers uh, centered at Kennedy Space Center in Florida is known as Biological Research in Canisters, Brick 19. Simon Gilroy is the PI for that experiment. And that will be the first experiment in the Gene Lab family where we will make open all the results of at the genetic and molecular level of how the plant adapts to uh, space flight. In the case of plants in space, they don't have to support their own weight. So they're like in gravity. C correct. Uh, so there isn't the signaling, the mechanical signaling, there's no mechanical loading. The plant doesn't have to hold itself up against gravity. So there's real-time signaling that goes on in the plant cells that cause the plant cells to be stronger when they do have to support their own gravity. When they don't have to support their own gravity, cellular changes happen. It, it, chemistry changes within the cell happens. And understanding those chemical changes may help scientists to genetically engineer plants on Earth, as well as for space travel, that will result in better biomass production for the Earth's population and for space travelers. And I think you told me that this is kind of part of that new approach that we mentioned at the beginning. How is this, how is this new and different for us? Well, um, unlike earlier biological research uh, that was flown on the shuttle or even earlier space uh, vehicles by NASA, that data was available to a small number of researchers that, were, that got the grant and were funded by NASA or the NASA researchers themselves. The new platform, the Gene Lab program, uh, will build an infrastructure for collecting, organizing, and disseminating this data in an open source way to any, any researcher or student in, in the world that wants to access it. You know, we have models for this, for example, in the, the SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Anyone can look for data among the SETI um, receiving signals that we receive from deep space, from the wide array of radio telescopes that we have and so forth, to try to detect signals from outer space. There's also models of this um, in, uh, in other forms of genetic and, and protein folding, where people could, you know, I remember a decade or so ago, it was popular for computer enthusiasts to share their computers and look for patterns among proteins and, and genomic data. So this gene lab is kind of taking that concept uh, uh, to heart, and but in this case, the, the central data that's going to be made available is data from the ISS experiments for various model organisms. So, you know, as a scientist yourself, putting, putting yourself in the place of the people who aren't already connected to space station research somehow, what, what is there to be excited about about that? Well, this data will slowly accumulate, you know, starting with this BRIC-19 experiment, and then be available for researchers who might have slightly different uh, hypotheses to investigate. You know, the, the particular uh, investigator in the BRIC-19 experiment has a particular very dedicated hypothesis to, uh, to test for. But the data may be widely used for some novel uh, hypothesis that no one else has thought of yet. A student, a graduate student may think of that or may develop a thesis out of that, and the data is available to him. Uh, he, he or even research companies don't have to spend a lot of money to go obtain the data. It's already there for them.
So there's really no telling what might come out of it. Well, it, it is very exciting in that sense, and I know that at NASA headquarters, uh, uh, it is a very uh, it is the leading program uh, among all the biological experiments. It, it's it's really a new research model. It's not focused on a single experiment or a single piece of hardware. It's a whole family of investigations, and then all the data from all of those model organism investigations is made available to the public. That sounds really exciting. So we will look forward to, I guess, seeing some of the experiments in real time as they take place on the space station, and then uh, hopefully hearing more from scientists who have ideas about how to use it. And I'm sure we'll be hearing more from you over the course of the next couple of uh, expeditions I'd as well. I'd love to come back as often as you'll have me. All right. Thanks again. And this was Vic Cooley, the lead Expedition 41 and 42 scientist.